My name is Lyric Kennard, and I am so happy that you could join me today. In this class, I'd like to show you how to use fabrics that we as quilters don't normally use because they're too difficult to work with. They're really not. And silks and velvets are so scrumptious and lovely that you've just got to try them. I will show you some tips and tricks for making them easier to work with and you can put them in your quilts or we are going to make a beautiful silk scarf pieced and add a beaded fringe that takes it from really lovely to truly elegant. Alright, so beautiful fabrics. We all love fabric. We're quilters, aren't we? Fabric is what it's all about and it's the touch of it that we love. You might have a little collection of silks. I love vintage Japanese kimono fabric. So I have shibori cloth. I have these beautiful silks in little pieces that um, I don't necessarily want to use in a quilt. What better way to use it than put them together in a silk scarf that you can touch all day long. Mm, so much fun. Here is a way to make these silks behave more like the cottons that you're used to. I'm going to take my pressing surface and a nice hot iron and I'm going to use a towel on my work surface for two different reasons. Just any old ugly towel, as long as it's smooth and doesn't have a texture to it, then we're just fine. All right, so a beautiful piece of shibori silk, wiggly, slippery. Let me introduce you to your new best friend, spray starch. If you put a light layer of starch on the fabric, and I'm gonna get rid of this because it is in the way while I'm working. If you put a light layer of spray starch on your cloth, and then gently iron it dry and do that again a couple times, the soft and slippery silk becomes much easier to work with. It behaves more like cotton. It even stiffens up just enough that you can use your rotary cutter with it. You can pick it up and pin it and it doesn't, send, it doesn't tend to slide and wiggle like it usually does. Now this is why I have the towel on top of my surface. Spray starch can make a mess all over everything. So I like to cover everything up. Now, look how nice and stiff that is. Much easier to work with. This way you'll be able to piece it and cut it with your rotary cutter or scissors without it wiggling around quite so much. Now you might also have these gorgeous luscious velvets that you want to work with, but velvets and irons often don't get along. If you have a towel laid out on your surface, put the velvet nap side down, that's the fuzzy side, against the towel and the fuzzy part of the towel protects the nap. And I'm going to do the same thing with my velvet that I did with my silk fabric and give it a couple layers on the back this time of spray starch. Gently iron it dry. I'm not pressing very hard and I'm keeping the iron moving so that I'm not crushing the beautiful fuzzy nap. Now, here is something to remember. You're going to have to wash out all of that spray starch after we piece our scarf to give it back its beautiful soft drape and slippery, silky feel feeling. So make sure your cloth can take it. If you're buying new yardage, give it a gentle soak in water. I use warm water and I use shampoo because silk is a protein fiber and shampoos are formulated to work with protein fibers. There we go. Now the silk is not nearly as drapey as it was before, but it will be much easier to work with. And after the scarf is all pieced together, then we can give it a very gentle rinse in cold water, lay it flat to dry, and it will regain that beautiful silkiness that we love. Alright, how do you make a scarf 
out of these silk fabrics. I like to make a pattern, kind of a pattern, not really a pattern, more of a guideline with freezer paper, mostly because it's long and you can pull it out as long as you'd like. And it's about the width that I personally enjoy. If you have a very favorite scarf, I suggest you measure that and use those dimensions. I tend to like one wrap around my neck and for the ends not to hang too long when it has beads on the end. So 48 inches is about right for me. Again, make your own decision. Decide how long you want your scarf to be. And I've decided I like them narrower so they don't fill up quite so much bulk around my neck. If you like it wider, if you like to be nice and all snugly warm, then go ahead and make it wider. You can tape two pieces of freezer paper together. All right, now I have rolled it out, got a length at the size that I like, and there are a couple things to consider. You're going to have a fold line in your scarf. You're going to be designing two sides at the same time, but you know how they fold and twist around, so you really are going to be seeing both sides. The other thing to consider is that you have the part that wraps around your neck, the wrap, and then you have the part that hangs down on the end of the scarf. I call this the design space. I give it eh, 12, 15 inches or so, and that's the part that doesn't have to bend so much. So if you have some fabrics that are not as soft and slippery, or the stiffer trims, that would be a good thing to use in your design space. So I've simply given myself about a half of an inch of seam allowance. And you know what the great part of this is? Seam allowance doesn't really matter. When you're piecing together a scarf, you can be kind of improvisational. You can be spontaneous. You don't have to measure everything exactly. If it shrinks just a little bit as you're sewing your seams up, it's okay. So again, half an inch or so of a seam allowance all the way around the edges. I've marked in the fold line and I've marked in my design space. From here, you have two different choices. You can turn your freezer paper over, have the shiny side up, and iron down all of your fabrics. You know how that shiny side sticks to your fabric? We use it that way for applique and for foundation piecing. You can use that aspect of the freezer paper here on your scarf. I'm simply going to pin my pieces to the freezer paper with silk pins, if I can find them. It's best to begin with all of your fabric already starched and stiff and ready to use. Let's think about design. I have various different fabrics. They're not all terribly matchy, but I'll usually use them in one colorway. One of the scarves I made was all greens. The other one I showed you was in golds and olives and copper. I also have this beautiful collection of oranges and blues and reds. And it runs from peachy to, to deep red and everything in between. And I love what's happening with the complementary color scheme. When you get two colors straight across from each other on the color wheel, the colors tend to vibrate and pop and just really set each other off gorgeously. All right, I have a piece of sari fabric that is super wonderful. It is embroidered, it has sequins on it. And do I want that part twisted up and covered up around my neck? No, I don't think so. So I know that I'm going to want it to be somewhere down on the end where it's going to be shown off a little bit. Maybe a piece that is not as exciting would go more in the wrap area. Another thing to keep in mind as you begin to place your pieces and just play around with the design is that it's really nice to have some empty, kind of blank areas, a place for the eye to rest. In this scarf, I've got the whole middle section, just a few plain pieces. 
First of all, it's easier to piece that way. Second of all, they're beautiful, soft charmeuse that feels wonderful against the skin. And nobody's going to see it as much. I save most of the fancy stuff for down on the ends, where people are really going to see it. As I was working with placing my pieces, there were a few things I learned. The first thing was that my very favorite piece of fabric with the sequins and the hand embroidery, it's a piece of a sari from India, bled all over the place. I laid it down on my towel and starched it and ironed it and immediately the red came out onto the towel. Test, test, test your fabrics before you use them because I would have hate to have found that out as the scarf was resting against my favorite white blouse. Um, and because this is something that's going to be used, it could get perspiration or rain on it, it might be washed, I don't want to use fabrics that are going to bleed. This I'll save for an art quilt that won't ever be washed. Well, what do you think so far? I found a luscious, yummy, piece of blue velvet that I had forgotten about in my stash and I've put my fabric together with a big piece in the middle again that wonderful softness around your neck and my pieces are mostly cut to about the right size. If you'll notice my fabric's going off the end of the pattern just a little bit I don't mind it's okay. We'll need to take about an inch off of that We'll get that out of the way so I can do that. And you know, when the fabric is starched this way, it makes it so easy to work with. It's just almost like working with cottons. Alright, so I have blues and oranges next to each other, some empty space for the eye to rest, all my favorite pieces down on the ends, I'm going to trim up the last piece and add it in. And again, remember that it doesn't really, really matter if your pieces are perfect and if they match exactly right. Again, did you see how I used the rotary cutter once and not the other time? This is one of those times where you don't have to be perfect in every little thing, which makes it a lot more fun. You know, sometimes we are so worried about being perfect that we don't give ourselves permission to make mistakes. We don't give ourselves time to learn a new technique. And then it's not fun anymore. It's a lot more fun to just play and not worry about things. All right, I have my scarf laid out. You notice that one of these not perfect things, it's not exactly on the fold line where the seam's going to be. I don't care. It doesn't matter. What if I put the fold line in the middle of the scarf instead of on the ends? I'll show you how to do that. In our next lesson, I will take these pieces and show you how to work with them at the sewing machine. Join me there.